three, two, and one. Matt Lessinger here with Nolan Dalla. We're back for, I believe this is our sixth intelligent conversation. Um, I enjoy every one of them and I am sure I will enjoy this one as well. Uh, the topic today is going to be the changing role of media in society. Uh, we felt like this was an appropriate topic, especially since we are less than two weeks out from election day and the media has played a very influential role in politics and everything related to the election. So let, let's dive right in. And, and Nolan is a great uh, person to discuss this topic. Um, he has been uh, involved with media extensively. Um, he was the media director for Poker Stars, which was the you know, number one poker site in the world. Uh, his writings were translated into many different languages just so all the users of Poker Stars could read what, what he wrote as, as the media director. He was also then the media director for the World Series of Poker. And again, millions of people uh, read what he wrote uh, every single night uh, for what was a weeks long event every year. Um, those were the two main ones. And then Nolan, you also shared with me that you worked at the Washington Post for, for one day. There's, there's gotta be a good story <laughs> behind that. Yeah, yeah. I guess you know I have to give my uh, my bona fides or my credentials, and that they will be somewhat brief uh, here. I mean, like twenty, <laughs> more like eight hours. I think seven hours. I think I walked out after the seventh hour. But, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> but the, here, before I get to the Washington Post story, I, I'll give sure. you this: that I, I would never consider myself uh, an expert in the media. That's kind of like being a you know, an expert in, uh, you know, physics, so to speak. I mean, there's, you know, there's so much science out there that you can't really know it all. And the same thing is true for, uh, for the media because it's rapidly changing and uh, it's hard to keep up with. And, and, and I've always been a consumer of media. In other words, I've always been a reader and a watcher of the media. And I've certainly followed a lot of the criticism of the media, some of it, uh, much of it, uh, uh, well-deserved. And we're going to discuss that on this uh, uh, on this program and in this discussion. So I'm I'm looking forward to addressing some of those things. But I, I'd like to uh, rack up all the way to my earliest days and just let you know that um, you know I don't want to get too personal here, but like maybe it's just growing up as an only child and and always having always needing something to stimulate uh, myself, uh, you know, with uh, new information and entertain myself. I, I started reading newspapers, you know, maybe at, you know, age six or seven, I remember just always having a, a daily newspaper and that was the thing. And, and I could not, you know, even when I was in like junior high school and high school, I didn't feel complete. I didn't feel educated or validated, or I didn't feel like I was connected to the world unless I'd read that daily newspaper. Wow. And so I don't know if people today, it's newspapers are not nearly as big a, a force as they were, say, growing up when there was really television, radio, and newspapers. And of course, like every other person growing up, I consumed radio and television. Uh, but, but the newspaper was the printed word and the, uh, you know, having to turn the pages physically and look at the sports section and look at the lifestyle section, and of course, the news section, and especially the editorial section, where there were opinions from people uh, often who, this is when I didn't have much of an opinion about anything when I was young, but these are people who shape my opinions, reading their opinions. So being exposed to, I think, information and ideas from all over the world was very important to me. And so it, 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 it really um, was a, I guess a, it was fertile soil for, for a foundation, uh, a, a love really of, of information. And I think that's what the media is at its essence it provides a garden of enlightenment into other cultures, into our own society, into what we can be, into how bad we are, into how good we are, into our greatness, into our evil, into everything. And that's what the media at its best provides is that spotlight. And so I have found that when I don't have access to media, whether it's again, newspapers, television, and now social media, uh, uh, I can't even imagine what that's like. 
I know a lot of my friends uh, uh, are not connected to media. They don't say read newspapers or they're not really as connected to, they don't watch say the news. And to me that's, well, it just seems like a very empty life or at least a, a life full of uh, uh, less enlightenment, let me just say. Uh, I can't even imagine going through a day or certainly not a week without being uh, exposed to uh, to what's going on in the world. And that requires, we use the word media for that. And so that, that has been, you know, really my, I guess, upbringing and why I consider media so important. I'll now tell the very quick story about the Washington Post. Okay. When I was, uh, it, it, it was, I just graduated from college and was living in Washington and I desperately needed, desperately needed a a job, uh, like, a, you know, money. I needed to make money. I was already working, but I wasn't making enough money. And so I took a night job and the, the job was, it was, everybody says, oh, you work the Washington Post, you know, like I'm uh, Carl Woodward or, or uh, Bernstein or something here, you know, so, I mean, it was certainly wasn't that I wasn't, I wasn't working for, for Bradley, you know, Ben Bradley, I mean, uh, or, or, or Katie Graham, uh, I was like at the lowest level, they, they had a thing called an inserter. Uh, that was my job. I was an inserter. Now, like I thought, well, what's an inserter? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you must stand there in front of a, sorry, sit there in front of a computer and you, you know, like an editor or something. Well, an inserter means you stand in a warehouse. And you know, when you used to pick up the newspaper and you'd see these the like the skull sections from yeah. uh, Sears or JC Penney <laughs> or whatever, and they'd have all these like, you know, advertisements. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody has to physically, the machine doesn't do it. So you have to physically insert these uh, pages into the uh, into the newspaper, and so by the thousands. So I, you know, so for eight hours I was like, and I think I made I think I made four dollars and fifty cents an hour, and after about you know I'm thirty minutes this, I looked down at my hands and there, and this all the pages are made of, of black ink, and the black ink is almost like still fresh because it's right off the presses, right. Mm -hmm. And so I looked down at my hands and I don't, I want to sound racist, but I, I thought I was black I mean, <laughs> because my <laughs> hands were completely black covered in ink. And uh, so I made like, I think 425 an hour. This is like 1985 or something. I forgot what year, 86. Yeah. And so I, they, they, they gave us a break every two hours. It was like a, you know, it was a terrible job. So the, there were these vending machines and the vending machines had like, you know, a Coke machine and, you know, the snacks where you had to like shake the machine for the Fritos or the Snicker right. bar to fall out. It would never, you know, that little <laughs> twirly thing, it would never like go all the way when you put the coins in. <clears throat> You'd always have to slam to, to make the Snickers bar bar fall into the tray, you know? Right. <laughs> so everybody's gone through that, right? At least. Oh, I'm yeah. So, so I, 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 after about, I think two or three breaks, I, I added up all the money I'd spent on the snacks and it cost me money to work the job. Oh my I, God. I drank, I drank five Cokes and I had four Snickers bars and had three bags of Fritos. And by the time I walked out, you know, at, at seven o'clock in the morning, I think I was stuck $4 and 50 cents. <laughs> So I said, I said, pretty much fuck this. That was my career at the Washington Post. I was out of there. I don't blame you. Oh my gosh. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, what a, and I, I thought sitting in front of a video poker machine was bad. That was, that was <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, all right. But I mean, speaking of newspapers, I mean, it clearly readership has, has fallen way off as, as less and less people go to newspapers for their news. Uh, do you think that makes us worse off? Are, are we, would we be better off if we, if, if a greater part of the population got their news from newspapers like they used to, or like has the, the media has become more accessible, but I, I'm sure that carries both positives and negatives with it, right? Well, this may be, you asked a good question that I probably not qualified to answer here uh, because uh, the absorption of information uh, comes through, you know, in, di in different ways. And we're all, uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses as to how we absorb things. And the, the key word I'm looking for is retention. In other words, I can watch a program, but ask me about that program uh, uh, tomorrow. How much will I remember? Mm -hmm. Now, now put an article in front of me and let me read the same program. Let me read the script basically of that program and then ask me tomorrow how much, and, and so how much of the information do I retain or understand, comprehend, translate? Uh, I always thought the written word, in other words, books or newspapers or articles, 
in magazines, things like that. They yeah. actually require the uh, consumer or the, um, well, the person that consumes the information. Uh, you have to be, you know, an active participant. You can't fake reading something, right? You can't mm -hmm. daydream. What, well, I guess you could, but you wouldn't, you, why would you read if you're not going to absorb it, right? right. So when, when you're reading, you're actually having to use your mind. And where a, past, a television or even social media, to a some extent, is is a very much is very much a passive um, uh, exercise, and so I think you lose something there. Uh, I, there's many times, many shows I've watched, and then asked me about them a, a week later, I can't even remember, you know, who was in it or or what. The, I, I'm sure people listening understand this that when you read something, uh, you just retain more. I think that's true also with. People that are certainly that read fiction or read, you know, anything, they 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 just seem to. Hey, do you remember what uh, that that part of the Stephen King book? And they can remember something. And it's the same thing with news. Uh, when you're reading something about a, 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 a something that's especially something that's shocking or that really moves you emotionally, I I can remember just almost hundreds of things that I've read that always you know affected me. And there's certainly things I've seen in television and television news that affected me as well. And you really can't get past the power of imagery. You know, when you have television mm -hmm. and you have uh, photography and film and interviews and sound and uh, special effects, uh, all of those things really do enhance, uh, you know, uh, uh, the entertainment factor. But in terms of retention or understanding the material, I guess I am much more of a traditionalist that reading um uh, uh about an event uh is is just i th i think and of course i'm a writer so i'm biased but i think it is i think it is a um uh, uh, superior way to digest and understand uh the material by the way I, I i could be swayed on this i think but i'd like to hear your your thoughts on that oh no that's a great point i mean i i agree a thousand percent um you know the only time that i feel that people really uh, absorb anything is when they're giving it their full attention and and when you're reading you're just even if you're not giving it a hundred percent attention you're giving it enough attention to be reading it and comprehending it and then sometimes if you find that you were daydreaming you're like oh let me go back and reread that because i i didn't really get what what i was just reading and you have the power to do that which you obviously i mean i guess you could do that on tv you could rewind it with you know live tv these days but i think that that's less likely to happen than somebody just, you know, reading something and a particular quote catches their attention or a section. It's like you can reread it, you can absorb it as, as much as you want. Um, you know, when you're watching a, a movie, like all of us can remember movie lines from our favorite movies, yeah. uh, but because there are favorite movies, because we've seen them more than once, because, you know, we want to give our full attention to it whereas with you know news channels these days i feel like the um you know not just that less people are reading newspapers but less people are consuming televised news in the same way that they used to right i mean back in the day it was the televised news was on at five o'clock at night six o'clock at night and that was the news hour and you if you were going to watch the news, that's what your time was dedicated to. You were going to absorb the news during that time. Um, I mean, when CNN launched, I want to say in the early 80s, um, I, I don't think it was ever meant to be a 24-hour news cycle. I think the purpose of CNN was like not everybody can be in front of their TV at five o'clock at night or six o'clock at night. So we're going to do the news whenever it's convenient for you, but we don't expect you to watch for more than a half hour or maybe an hour and get the news of the day and then move on. You know, right, that, that was the original point of something like CNN. Um, I mean, my, my memory from my, I mean, I'm a little younger than you, um, but my memory of the turning point for CNN was the Gulf War. Right. You remember like in 1991 um, when basically it was it was live on TV. Yeah. Right. And Wolf Blitzer. I mean, uh, I, I 
it blows my mind to think now that Wolf Blitzer is still on the air because 30 years ago he seemed like this elderly presence to me, but, <laughs> you know. But he's still on with his, you know, gray beard and whatever. But uh, my memory of that specific day of the the invasion was that. Uh, we had a some sort of school function that evening where everybody was present, all the students and all the parents and everybody. And I can't even remember what that function was because nobody wanted to be there. Like everybody had through word of mouth heard about that CNN was basically televising the Gulf War and everybody wanted to go home and watch it. And to me, that was the turning point of televised news on cable. Like that was the dominant story that uh, at that time was not just the news of the war, but the fact that uh, reporters were on the ground there and CNN was the way we could watch it. I feel like ever since that time, so again, I don't know if that's just because of my personal experience if I'm biased, but in, in my mind, it was like from that point forward, people began to absorb more and more of their news from cable, new from cable news outlets and then in the mid 90s fox news launched and msnbc launched and then it started to go a whole different direction and i mean did you have the same the, the same memory that the same basically transition from not just newspaper to televised news but then from televised news to to cable news yeah i really that's an interesting story i i don't think i'd really pondered um that the fact the fact that that different events will have different uh, impacts on on everyone you know depending on age and you know what you remember and when when you were you were most impressionable uh, you just told a really interesting story that again I really never thought much of uh, I remember the Gulf War the first Gulf War there were two of course mm -hmm. but the first Gulf War being a big thing and the second Gulf War was a big thing on cable news as well and I I would I would back it up a little further. Again, uh, you, you talk about age, but uh, I'm a little older. So I remember the, I think a turning point for people that maybe are, I'm 58. So if you remember when you were in high school, uh, the Iran hostage uh, crisis happened, mm -hmm. I believe in 1979. Uh, and that's when uh, the Iranian revolution happened. The Ayatollah Khomeini came, came to power and uh, the Iranian, uh, a, lot of, a lot of students basically, students and militia groups overran the United States Embassy in Tehran and took, um, I forgot the number, but 70 or so, I forgot the number, but 65, 70 American uh, embassy personnel and Marines hostage. So we had what was called the, um, the Iran hostage crisis. Sure. And, and if you were around in 1979, ABC News did something that had not been done before. Uh, right after the, well, it used to be the 10 o'clock news, or in some cities it was 11 o'clock news. Uh, right after the local news, they would go right back to ABC. And this is up against Johnny Carson, by the way. Right. Johnny Carson like was the king of late night TV. And nobody's watching ABC or uh, CBS late night. NBC was the king, Johnny Carson. So ABC decides uh, to, to, to headline this new 30 minute show, the Iran hostage crisis. And mm -hmm. Ted Koppel, who no one had ever seen before, very few people had seen before, uh, comes on the air and would talk about the Iran uh, hostage crisis. And it would be this large lettered uh, headline across the top of the screen, day one, day 65, mm -hmm. day 133. And so every day there was this, it was like watching a soap opera or a, um, a serial event or, or, or a, a series, except that it wasn't funny. It was serious. Yeah. In fact, because of, you know, also the times that we lived in, you know, we were kind of in the period of malaise, if you recall the Jimmy Carter speech of 1978. This is before Reagan. I mean, there was a certain, we'd lost the Vietnam War. I mean, there was a certain uh, fear and, and a lot of uh, America, a great deal of America was very worried. And all of a sudden now the Iranians are overthrowing their government and, and, and taking American prisoners. And they're sitting over there uh, with blindfolds on and rifles to their heads. And that mm -hmm. bothered a lot of Americans. So when Ted Koppel would come on every night and interview a, he'd interview the Iranians themselves, Bonnie Sauter, one of the heads of the uh, Iranian student militias. 
uh, uh, was on television saying why they overtook. I mean, it, this was remarkable theater. It was it was better than any kind of a movie you could watch to watch the Iran hostage crisis happening. And I must say that as far as being impressionable, uh, you know, to watch this on live television, uh, even though there's nothing really happening, it's not like, you know, they interviewed any of the hostages or what have you, right. but just being there every day and then every night, you know, you turn in and I think after day, I believe it was day 444. Again, I could be wrong on this. Wow. That's yeah. when the, you know, this goes on for over a year, almost a year and a half. And day 444, I believe, was when, of course, the hostages are released on uh, January 20th or 21st, 1981, Reagan's uh, inauguration. So, uh, and then, of course, that ends the, you know, that ends that, that particular episode. And then 10 years later, we get the thing you're talking about. And then 10 years later, we get 9-11 and the, uh, another one. So, uh, right. and now I would say that we would, I would even say that Trump, the, the phenomenon of Trump that's been going on five or six years now is kind of that same, it is that same drama, that same soap opera, like, oh my God, what did he say now? What, what happened today? What crisis mm -hmm. is happening? What's the latest scandal? I mean, you just, you turn on the TV and there's a certain sense of, uh, um, anticipation maybe fear you know yeah. uh, and so i do believe that uh, that that these things uh, uh, do go hand in hand that's a great story i mean i knew about the the coverage of the hostage crisis but not to that degree i didn't know that there was a nightly show every night that that covered it which really is a, a hook i mean i i can see why that would you know once you start watching it kind of like a soap opera like you said you you don't want to stop because the one you miss could be the day when they get released or when everything finally gets resolved so that's that's quite a story i mean so then you mentioned 9 11 right which is the next big story so here's here's what i remember and and again you can tell me if, if my memory jibes with yours um so I, I read that fox news and msnbc both launched in 1996 to me, neither one of those were a big deal. Um, from what I read, Fox News had a, a conservative slant to it from day one, but I, I don't think it was nearly as pronounced as it is now. Maybe it was a little more subtle or maybe just yeah. not as many people were watching. Mm -hmm. um, what I do remember is on 9-11, objectively speaking, I think they had the best coverage. Um, for whatever reason, I think Fox News was really on the ground for that. I remember most of the TVs where I was being tuned to Fox News. And this is not at a time when Fox News was overly political. You know, this was just, they, they just happened to be another cable news network. But they, they had reporters on the ground and they had um, just... Uh, the scrolling coverage that they do now, like on the bottom of the screen, I want to say that was the first time they broke that out, but I could be wrong. But that's the first time I remember seeing it. Whereas like in big, bold letters on the bottom, you'd have scrolling like exactly what was happening up to the minute, um, which was very engrossing. And especially being... Um, at work at the time and we weren't allowed to have the volume on yeah. i think that's the main reason we we had fox news yeah, on was right. because it, it was an easy visual um i i would say that that probably began their ascendance um and then that continued through like you said the second gulf war where a lot of um liberal leaning people were against the war for various reasons um you know even if we thought that osama bin laden needed to be hunted down we didn't see what the connection was to invading iraq necessarily and you know the so a, a lot of um uh standard news stations you know gave the pros and cons whereas i think fox news was more gung-ho about the war in general that you know, George Bush supported it. So Fox News supported it. And so they, again, had the much more in-depth coverage of the war, which if that was something you were looking for, that was where you would turn. And 
maybe that also helped their ascendance as well. And then uh, obviously the rest is history when you carry on through, you know, the end of the George Bush years, uh, George W. Bush, where he left office at a record low popularity. And uh, I mean, as an aside, it's, it's unfathomable to me that Donald Trump maintains like a, a popularity rating in the high 30s, whereas George W. Bush was in the low 20s when he left office, and, and justifiably so. But it's like if George W. Bush got a, a 21% uh, favorability rating on his way out of office, like I, I just, it blows my mind that Trump isn't, uh, doesn't have numbers equally as low. Uh, but be that as it may, you know, Fox News realized that if Republicans were ever going to get back into office, you know, when Obama got elected, that they would basically have to run a news cycle on everything Obama is doing wrong. And that's what eight years of Fox News was. And, and that's, in my mind, what's led to the increased polarization that's carried through to today uh, and obviously been amplified on social media. I know Fox News is a... Uh, sometimes seen as a bit of a boogeyman. Um, but I, I think there's also some basis in reality to the fact that they um, amplified the uh, different political leanings. Like they, they were clearly a right-leaning uh, news outlet at a time when just about everybody else was trying to stay neutral. Um, it, would you agree or disagree, or what, what's your thoughts? Well, you, you said something. Yeah, you you said something that I think is really profound, and I would like to maybe amplify it again because it bears repeating and and some elaboration. Uh, and that's that uh, Trump's uh, approval ratings versus, say, George uh, uh, W. Bush's approval ratings, which were significantly lower. Now, of course, you know in, in uh, the fall of 2008, uh, you know, there was a global economic crash. So that, that's that's part of it. But not, uh, Bush's numbers were taking anyway, right. uh, uh, even before that. So you know, so the question is why? And this this is not a political uh, question. It's uh, it's one that gets right to the, the the heart of our discussion, which is about media. Mm -hmm. Well, George W. Bush did not have the army of social media uh, websites. Uh, cheerleaders, uh, the, the, the Fox, you know, again, was much more sane back then. But, you know, there was no, there was Newsmax did not exist. Breitbart did not exist. Right. Uh, Russ Limbaugh was around, but even he was, you know, if, if he's now completely off of the cliff, at least he was back on the edge at that time. I mean, all <laughs> of the right wing media was still somewhat sane back then. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they certainly were not, uh, uh, sycophantic in the sense of just you know almost like a cult which is really what i know this is a very partisan comment but uh you know when you when you see what's going on with right-wing media today and by the way this is not a fringe this is like 40 percent of the media or mm -hmm. you know is, is this way at least slanted this direction so you know george w bush was not really a movement he was not a you know did not have a you know there was a trump, trump whether you like him or not is a movement uh, uh it, George H. George W. Bush was not a movement president. Did not have a great movement. He had the support of conservatives, but it, but it, there was no such thing again as a media army behind him. I've, I'd heard this uh, comparison. Let's go all the way back to 1973-74. I've heard people say this that if Richard Nixon would have had uh, now Richard Nixon was not a conservative, but let's suppose that the same uh, essential structure existed in social media back in 1973-74 during the Watergate days as exists to today, Richard Nixon would not have had to resign. He would have had just, he would have put out all this stuff and 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 the uh, the sacred fans would have swam with it and there would have been this alternative universe of reality and the Democrats are just nothing but partisan and not to attack Richard Nixon. So again, if you, and you could apply this to other periods of history and, and think of how scary that might be, by the way. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't frighten you, it should. That that and, and how powerful this alternative universe of partisanship is today, and how different it was even 10, 15 years ago. So I think that what you said there is very, very important, and that gets to really one of the 
fundamental differences that exist today in the media that just never existed before. And the media has been flawed before, they've made mistakes, they've been partisan. You know, yes, 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 yes. But it's never been like this. And the truth has never seemed, listen to what I'm saying here, please, please. The truth has never seemed to matter less than today. And that's the scary thing. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that frightens, that should, that's the thing that should frighten everyone. It's one thing to have a partisan view. Hey, I have a, a conservative slant on economics or my foreign policy views are hawkish. That's fine. We may disagree on that, but you know what? I know most of the people that think that way, they can probably, uh, we have a common set of facts, a mm -hmm. common set of history that we can point to and have some agreement uh, on which to disagree. That does not exist any longer. And now we're getting into an absolute panoply of, of, of chaos. And I, I, I will get to this later about what's the future, but that's the problem. And it does not seem to be getting better. It seems to be getting worse. And would you agree, I mean, this goes back to our first conversation about social media, but it extends beyond social media to news outlets as well, is that at, at the moment, there seems to be no real penalty for purposefully spreading what is known to be a fake story, right? I mean, there's definitely no penalty on social media. Like, I could go on and say the most outrageous thing, and maybe it will be censored, but nobody's going to come to my house and arrest me, and nobody's going to uh, sue me, or at least, uh, you know, they're unlikely to be successful. Like, I could say the most outrageous thing right now. If, if my reputation and, and my ethics were, were just out the window, and so could you, and so could anybody. So, you know, does part of it come back to that? I mean, because for me, you know, people on the right want to attack something like the New York Times. But the New York Times, just as an example, it's like if you write for the New York Times and you get something wrong, you're probably fired. Right. I mean, there is a a, a real sense of um, uh, accountability, right, because they want there to be trust. So if you can't trust what we're saying, then then we're we lose all our value at that point. So, you know, for me, reputable news outlets care about their reputation. I mean, that's the definition of reputable. Right. So, but, but social media, no, uh, no recourse for a fake story, but now even worse is like certain news outlets and politicians can just put something out there. They know it to be fake. They're just hoping it gains traction. Then maybe it does gain traction. Maybe it doesn't, but let's say the story is completely disproven. Why aren't we um, holding the originators of these stories to account more? Is it because they're, it, it's slipperier, like it's harder to tell where the stories began? Is it because people could just say, oh, I thought this was true? And then even when we know deep down that they knew it wasn't true, like somebody saying that Hillary Clinton ran a prostitution ring out of a pizza parlor, you know, they knew this wasn't true. They, they knew, like they can claim they thought there was truth to it, but anybody with a brain in their head knows it wasn't true. So can, is there any way we can hold, have some level of accountability? Because if we can't, then I'm with you. It scares the hell out of me. Um, what well, I, I, yeah, that's, it's really uh, tough to, to, to say. Um, you know, we'd like to think everyone that's, you know, here that's listening, yourself, myself, we always like to think of ourselves as the exception, right? You know, oh, I would mm -hmm. never believe that lie, or I, I, I always want to find the truth. No, ask the people on the right, the far right. They think that they're searching for the truth. They think that yeah. the people they listen to are telling them the truth. They have a completely different idea of what the truth is. But the problem is, again, there are, there are, there's this thing called a common set of facts. And when that's abandoned, that's the problem. And I'd like to back up and, and I, I think it's very important to, to recognize um, I, I, what I think is the genesis of the problem. Uh, and it requires, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you like history, like I do, it requires rewriting the tape a little bit. And 
looking at, at the history of American media. And uh, uh, this will be a name that maybe some of you listening will, will, will remember. And if you don't know about this person, this really was the father of, of what I consider to be the chaos. And it goes all the way back to the 1920s. There was a columnist named Walter Winchell. And I have to get back up even further, but part, newspapers have always been partisan, like the Hearst newspapers. Everyone remembers the Hearst chain and they owned a, a great number of newspapers and driving uh, the United States toward the Spanish-American War, say back in 1898, I believe. And, you know, basically drumming up um, the reason for war. Well, that was the Hearst newspapers. And uh, there, were co there, were, there were all kinds of conspiracy theories about they were in cahoots with the, the armaments industry and it was a, all a big cabal of, of corruption, which it probably was. Uh, but uh, really the newspapers, they were in very, uh, very, very bitter competition with each other. New York City, for example, which was the largest media market in the United States still is, they had eight newspapers, eight major newspapers competing. I think there were five morning newspapers and three afternoon editions. Can you imagine a newspaper yeah. having a morning edition and an afternoon edition? I mean, that's just like, and, and that's because there was no radio, there was no television, there was no social media. So the only way to know what was going on in the world was to, when the paper boy came and said, got the news, read all about it. You know, that old thing. Mm -hmm. Well, that was because that's breaking news. That was CNN breaking a story or Fox or uh, a tweet on social media. Bro, the breaking news, read all about it. You know, when you saw that, that was, uh, that was a tweet of the 19, you know, in 1915. Okay. And a guy named Walter Winchell recognized the, he was kind of an evil genius in the sense that he recognized that the news was not just merely uh there to be, you know, for information purposes, or was not just a civic good to be informed. He recognized that the news could be, and listen to me carefully, could be entertainment. He thought, he recognized that, that scandal and rumor and gossip and printing things that weren't quite always true, but boy, it'll sell newspapers. This columnist started, at, I forgot what newspaper, I think the New York Daily World or something, or you know, something that's gone now, and then the New York Daily News hires him, and then he's the first major syndicated columnist, and he becomes essentially the first Rush Limbaugh uh, uh, of America. And everyone, a lot of people say he's the most pop, most uh, powerful man in America, right, uh, uh, except for the president. And that's pretty much true. And if you look at Walter Winchell, what he, what he uh, uh, wrote, and how, the way he, 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 postured himself. Well, here's what he did. He created a lot of uh, younger Walter Winchells that came that recognized that the story wasn't the story. The person telling the story became the story. So now I'm going to fast forward almost a century later. You know, I'm, I'm going up all the way to the, to the current day. And how do we most of us get particularly our television news? We watch, what do we watch? We don't say we watched, you know, a network or a, a particular show in the sense of a, a title. We say, hey, did you see what Sean Hannity said last night? Did you see what Tucker Carlson said last night? Did you see what Rachel Maddow said last night? Did you see what John Stewart, when he had Comedy Central? Did you see what Bill Maher said last night? Did you see what, hear what Les, Russ Limbaugh said? Or I could go, Laura Ingram, I could go on and on and on that the news we get is filtered through these individuals and their own prism. And that, it, it, I don't care, even if you like what the person is saying, even if you're on their side, Rachel Maddow, for example, was probably pretty close to Ryan politically, pretty close, but I can watch her. And of course you're gonna be getting a warped sense of reality. doesn't mean that she's lying, but it just means that it's gonna be the, the stories that she picks out the things that she stresses, the guests that she has on. You notice I don't want to pick on just the right wing. You notice that? I'm, right. intentionally, I'm intentionally picking out Rachel Maddow because I think this is a two-way street with regard to the problem, which is the story is Rachel Maddow and watching her and watching her delivery. And would Rachel Maddow lie to, lie to me? Of course she wouldn't. No way. Sean Hannity would never lie to me. Tucker Carlson, did you see what he had about the riots yesterday? And then it's retweeted and it's got, you know, I don't know, 6 million people watching and then all of a sudden 16 million people have seen the retweets and the 
things that are shared on video. So the, the I call it the Walter Winchell factor. What he began with personality driven journalism is the problem today. Because a lot of people say, and I'll shift shuffle this back to you in a second, but mm -hmm. a lot of people say, oh, just give me the news. Just give me uh, uh, without all of the partisanship, without the Rachel Maddow, without the Tucker Carlson, without the, the Rush Limbaugh, just give me the news. Well, you know what? There are news stations that exist. Yes, there are news stations that exist that just give you what used to be called Walter Cronkite journalism, just mm -hmm. the news, basically a monotone delivery. And that's the way it is. And, you know, that's the way Walter mm -hmm. Cronkite used to talk. The most trusted man in America from, say, the 1950s up till he retired in around 1980. The most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite. Well, are, there's no Walter Cronkites anymore. Well, actually, there are, but they just don't get any ratings. And they're on things like C-SPAN. Go to C-SPAN. There, mm -hmm. there, there's news shows there. They're, they're largely nonpartisan. Go to PBS. It used to be called the McNeil Lair News Hour or the Washington Week in Review. There's a lot on PBS generally. These are not partisan shows. They're just the news. Uh, so you, there are BBC to, to a great extent. There are, there are a lot of different sources out there that provide just the news. And you know what? Their ratings suck. Yep. So don't give me this bullshit about people want the news. They don't want the news. They want to be entertained. Most people, I mean, most people want to be entertained, tickled, and get and 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 you tickle the funny bone and make them laugh, and you punch them in the gut and make them mad. And that's what TV journalists do. TV journalists. That's a really loose term. That's what these paid entertainers do because that's what the the front people are, and it's pretty much across the board. They're paid entertainers. They're clowns, you know, without the makeup. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but they are, they, are, they are juggling hoops and jumping through fire and pulling us by the hand with them. And they want us to get just as mad about the current scandal as everyone else. So this is a universal problem that is getting worse. And it's really part of celebrity culture where celebrities, if someone famous says it, it must be true. If somebody you've never heard of says it, well, no one pays attention. So the celebrity driven uh, fame culture really does fuel what I consider to be a completely distorted view, view of reality. And the distorted view of reality has poisoned consumer news. That was great. Because um, I had thought about that on some level, but not to the degree that you, you described. Now, I, I mean, I feel like there's some exceptions right i mean i don't like fox news uh, chris wallace for example i could watch shepherd smith back in the day i could watch because they weren't um they weren't doing opinion shows they're doing the news show and yeah it's got a a right-leaning slant to it but first and foremost i feel like they're still newscasters anderson cooper is a newscaster he's not giving an opinion show and it's going to be maybe left leaning, but I feel like first and foremost, it's the news. Are they more entertaining in, in one way or another than the people you described? Maybe, to be honest, I've barely checked out the outlets that, that you mentioned, and I am interested in the news, the unbiased news. So count me as one of the reasons why the ratings suck, because I, I haven't <laughs> well, tuned in. We're all guilty of that. I mean, say that again. We're we're all guilty. I, I don't mean to suggest I'm I'm this pillar of uh, of great behavior. I, I'm as guilty as anyone. Yeah, uh, no, we're we're all in that same boat. And now, to me, trying to separate this without getting political is is <laughs> such a slippery. No, for real, because obviously, somebody like yourself and myself. Let, let me let me say two things about this. So, first of all, somebody like Rachel Maddow, um, on, we are willing to question everything she puts before us. Isn't that more of a liberal thing that like, yes, we will see what she has to say, but yes, we're also going to sit there and analyze it while she's saying it. Whereas it feels like with the right wing shows, more people are just willing to take at the at the person's word, whatever they're saying in their news show. So 
it's such a false equivalence to me when people are like, oh, you've got Hannity on the right and you've got Tucker Carlson on the right and you've got Rachel Maddow on the left. And first of all, Rachel Maddow is a, is a result of having these people on the right. Like CNN being branded as some sort of liberal news outlet is a result of Fox News being a conservative news outlet. Like it's such a false equivalence to me. I, I feel like we have to go back to that starting point to even understand where we are today, where it's like you, you can't. And, and on top of that, I think because I mean, I've. I don't watch Rachel Maddow that often, but I do watch her more often than I would watch Hannity or Tucker Carlson. I think she's much more prone to cite sources and cite easily, um, easy to obtain statistics. Like if I get the sense that she's just pulling something out of her ass, then I'm gonna go check it and see, wow, that didn't sound right. Is that true? Is that not true? Maybe it's true. Maybe it was exaggerated. Very rarely is it completely false. Right. It's I, I can't remember a time when she said something that I was like, wow, I didn't know that. Let me check it. And then it was just completely demonstrably false. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I put right. something? Can I insert something? Sure. Matt? Absolutely. Uh, because you make a good point. I, I actually I disagree with you on that. OK. Uh, and here's why. Uh, conservative media. And again, we, we, we're focusing on Fox a little too much. Nothing. You know, I understand that's what people see, but it's 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 the case for all. Uh, again, anything socially, uh, so social media, television, radio, even conservative newspapers, and there are some, uh, 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 and publications, they, there is a conservative, what I, I call it an industry. It's, a, it's an alternative industry uh, 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 of intellectuals or academics who are conservative minded, and some of them are legitimate, by the way. I don't, I'm not right. disparaging things like the American Enterprise Institute or the Heritage Foundation. And uh, certainly publications like, well, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, um, National Review, these used to be pillars of conservative thought. And they still are, of course. Uh, and they still have, I think the word you were looking for earlier was journalistic standards. You know, National right. Review, I may not agree with a lot of the things that they print, but they're, they're going to have a certain amount of journalistic standards or they're not, they're not going to print. Certainly the Wall Street Journal is not going to print completely bogus uh things right. so what so how how do tucker carlson and uh this crap that's on breitbart and this other kind of a stuff how do, where are their where's their sourcing well actually there again there there are these i call them fox f-a-u-x fox uh, store, uh sources of of i call them quasi quack intellectuals and and you know like oil company studies designed to cast aspersions or doubt on climate change. That's a great example. Like, hey, there's a study by something called the American Energy Institute. I just made up that, by the way. I don't know if there's something called the American <laughs> right. Energy Institute, but they'll make up something like that. And it will be a study. And there'll be some guy that you've never heard of from with a doctorate from some mail order catalog who, who's, who's put his name on a study that climate change is bullshit. By the way, this happens all the time on all kinds of different uh, uh, subjects and topics. There is a conservative uh, alternative industry of so-called facts, or it's certainly very slanted, and a lot of it's just complete bullshit. And then we get into what, you know, I, I don't, didn't want to talk about it on the show here, but there is this disinformation that's spread and that's, 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 that's viral and becomes infectious and is actually very much poisoned what could be a constructive dialogue because it's so polluted now you can't even swim through the, through the sea of, 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 uh, of, of pollution here. So this is a real problem uh, and that you know, the traditional ac academic institutions are intellectuals or sources that people would cite uh, you know, usually from uh, think tanks or universities, they, they have been um, attacked to the point where they're, they're not only their credentials, I'm talking about usually on the left, by the way, the Brookings Institute, or if someone comes on from Columbia University or Yale, oh, that's one of those liberals. You know, they're, they're, their academic credentials work against them. So the study that they're, say, citing on the Rachel Maddow show of course, they won't ever see it because it'll never appear on Fox or won't appear on Breitbart or any of those other uh, sites. So 
they're, they're intellectual, they're academic, they're all the things that they've done their entire life. Even scientists, even scientists in their life's work counts against them. But I'll tell you what, release that study from that energy company that Exxon Mobil paid for, and man, it's a front page story on uh, Sean Hannity when there's something about the energy or, on, or gas prices or something. So this is the real problem here is that there is this alternative universe of facts. And when you say they're not citing facts, oh yes, they are citing quote unquote facts. It's just that, and again, we're another mm -hmm. uh, sidebar, Where's all this inf all this uh, information come from? Well, there's a lot of rich people who are conservative. There's a lot of rich people who are on the far right. I could get into the Koch brothers. I could talk about uh, Sinclair buying up local television stations, hundreds of them, and creating again a narrative that is they will say uh, conservative are patriotic or nationalistic or America first. These are code words for far right. right. These are code words for the far right. And they have a ton of money. Now the left has money too. I mean, there are a lot of benefactors on the left and, and, and I'm not denying that, but the right has a big bankroll. And that's the problem is there's no shortage of people. I call them hacks and pimps and whores ready to go prostitute themselves and put their name on a study for a big fat check <laughs> From an oil company yeah. there's a lot of people that do that and that's become one of the biggest problems in media let me ask you a, a follow-up question i mean when you talk about people where their credentials work against them where certainly you get that sense where like you've got somebody like dr fauci who's got 40 something years of experience right. and somehow people just want to ignore that but when i say people we're talking about a minority of the population. I mean, I think a majority of the population still, you know, has faith in him, still has faith in educated people and in science. I mean, despite what the headlines say. Excuse me, excuse me, Matt. Still, 30 percent you know, of the Republican Party doesn't. Yeah, well, I'm saying the majority of people. I'm not okay. saying I agree there is a significant minority that still has has some issue with these people, but is it but is it because of their education or is it because that reality has a liberal bias, right? Which is yeah. that what educated people are going to tell you they found is not what you want to hear as a conservative mouthpiece. So you're going to go to these alternative studies that are concocted out of thin air. I mean, I don't think it's so much the the education itself that's frowned upon, right? Or the, the science that's frowned upon. It's just that education and science produce realities that certain people don't want to buy into. Well, again, the left is always at a disadvantage here and always has been. Now, it's, it's much easier to be a leftist or a liberal, uh, say, in the last, you know, uh, this generation than it was, say, 50, 100 or 200 years ago. I mean, you know, 200 years ago, if you pronounce some of these ideas, you'd be arrested or thrown in prison and in some cases killed. I'm, right. you know, I'm not I'm not exaggerating. Here. Right. right. And, and and so, you know, we, we, we do have it better. The truth has never been more, you know, accessible to those who seek it uh, to, that, than today. Uh, I, I'd like to answer that by going back in history again, if I may, and discuss a little bit about uh, this, uh, this notion that the, 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 the media, the mainstream media is liberal. Uh, really, that's simply really not true. And let me explain why. Uh, going back to its foundation. Oh, wait, wait, can I just say uh, what, what yeah. I said was that reality has a liberal bias, not that mainstream media. No, I understand. But, I, but okay. that's, that's going to that's going to factor into my answer here, which let's say the reality, the reality, the reality, again, your, your one's reality is shaped largely through media. That's first of all important. You know, the things that I believe today are probably shaped to some of the things that I read as a teenager in those newspapers when I first opened the show. You know, I, 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 you know, you, it's, I, I talk about this in another uh, uh, discussion we had where everything is evolution. Every single conversation you have is a very small building block, block to the person who you are and what you believe. It's just a little brick, but you know what? It's still a building block. And so, uh, you know, all of these things do build up and the media, e even the things we try to tune out in the media still will, will penetrate in many cases, get through because it's just, you just can't tune out everything, right? But if you look at the media and what the notion of reality was, let's say 150 years ago, well, 
the media reality, it was pro-slavery. It was pro-war. It was anti-worker. You know, unions were, were thought of as a radical idea. It was natural, nationalistic. It was jingoistic. World War I, all, all, all national. I mean, we killed 50, 40 million people in a war for no reason whatsoever, for reasons purely based on nationalism, largely media driven in, in, in all countries. And, and, and so, oh, the media is liberal. No, they're not. The media is very far reactionary conservative, certainly going back many years that it, it was. It reinforces corporate power and wealth and war and nationalism and jingoism and certainly racism uh, up until uh, up until recently. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that. Um, uh, capitalism in this country, for example, capitalism is just is just taken for granted as oh that's the best economic system. Even liberal media, the so-called liberal media, does not question the notion of capitalism very often. Uh, socialism is used as a dirty word, and and, and these right. kind of uh, uh, things are constantly reinforced in, in the media, even by so-called liberal media, uh, that that capitalism is the way we are. That's the way it's always going to be. Now that's changing a little bit. The, you know, it's about five or six years ago, particularly with the Sanders campaign, socialism, mm -hmm. be, people started recognizing, hey, socialism's not really that bad. Look what's happening in, you know, parts of Europe and so forth. Uh, but here's the thing, the rich and the powerful in the United States always have a voice in the media. Look at the people who are interviewed. Look at the experts. There are mm -hmm. always people that are of the upper class. When's the last time you had anybody that was a working class person who was uh, given any kind of a forum, uh, a, a forum for for expression? Uh, right. and it almost never happens. Now they'll interview somebody on the street, and they usually sound like an idiot. And then there are a lot of idiots out there. I understand, but this is a very biased uh, industry because media is a business. It is an industry. It is entirely a profit-seeking machine. And the, it is very biased towards the establishment, towards business, towards capitalism, towards the status quo. I mean, that is a fact. So anybody that says, oh, the, the, the media is liberal. No, it's not. It's always been very conservative. It's always been in Wall Street's pocket. It's always reinforced every time we go to war. Real quick on this. Back when we had, you talked about Wolf Blitzer earlier. You know what the CNN uh, tagline across the screen was while they were shooting the missiles off? It was Operation Iraqi Freedom. And it was it was like, right. it was like That's the right. network, mm -hmm. CNN, not Fox, CNN. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were cheerleading the war. They were cheerleaders. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody bought into the thing about uh, the weapons of mass destruction myth. Everybody, including the media. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a few didn't, by the way. They're to be congratulated. But the mainstream, the New York Times bought into it. Uh, don't tell me the media is liberal. No, it's not. It is establishment, business, Wall Street centric conservative. It's better now than it was. There's still there's now a lot of voices for liberals, but it is at its core is profit driven and it's pro establishment. So please spare me this whole thing about the media being liberal. Even the mainstream media is 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 slants conservative. And then Fox News, of course, is very far right. If you want to know what left media is or liberal media is, go over in Europe and read some of the newspapers over there or watch some of the shows over in, over in other parts of the world, in Latin America. Go and watch some of that stuff. That'll show you what true liberal and leftism is. It's nowhere even close to what you, is identified as the left media in this country. Right. Because the, the needle has moved so far to the right that, right. yeah. And I mean, it, to me, that sort of goes back, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it sort of goes back to my thinking that um, more educated people are going to lean liberal. The same people that lean liberal are going to question the news more often, whereas more uneducated people are going to accept it as fa unquestioningly. So therefore, it, it's sort of a self-feeding mechanism where there's always going to be that uh, conservative slant because even if true conservatives make up a minority of the population, they're going to accept that news and question it less often, whereas the liberal majority is going to question the liberal news and 
it, it's going to break off into more factions where it's like there's people that will be on board and then people that will question it and then people that want something more centrist and it just people that are looking for something more nuanced. I, I mean, maybe that, maybe that in itself is a biased view, but um, that seems to be the reality to me where, you know, the Fox News would not be the number one uh, cable news network in the country. The opinion shows on Fox News would not be the number one rated uh, if more people questioned what they were seeing on there. Or do they just, like you said, it's entertainment. It's what they want to hear so they don't question it. So they go along with it without really thinking about it. And then when liberals come and tell them that the show is full of shit, oh, well, you're just a liberal. You're branded as a liberal, like you said. You know, you're, you're part of the liberal news, which as you pointed out, news really isn't liberal to begin with. I mean, it, it never has been. So, uh, okay, so with all this in mind, I, I, I'm a uh, somebody like you who at, at the beginning of my, I, I'm not saying me specifically, but a, a hypothetical person, um, who wants to get the real news. And maybe there are these fringe news networks that are reputable, but what would it take to trust a certain news outlet? Like what, do, what should I be looking for as a consumer of news if I don't wanna be entertained, but rather I want the truth or as close to the truth as possible? Yeah, well, I think the one of the things you just have to look at, uh, well, there's two things. I'll answer it in two ways. First of all, there's, there's no way to get a, away from the fact that um, media, and I'm speaking about North American media, it, it, it's really owned by five or six companies. I mean, it, it, you talk about consolidation. This is the, really the problem uh, that I was talking about a little bit before. And I, I am going to answer your question, but I have to address it in this context that it's very difficult to break through uh, a monopoly, really a stranglehold on, on information in this country that exists. Now, I, I give you the National Amusements, which is uh, Summer Redstone's company, uh, you know, that's uh, Paramount, Nickelodeon, um, uh, BET, uh, I, I could go on and on, Viacom. Uh, Disney, of course, owns ABC, ESPN, um, uh, Marvel Comics. I mean, all kinds of things. They're Vice News. Uh, you, you go on down HBO, of course. Uh, you go, go down to, you know, Time Warner, of course. Time Warner, CNN, of course, and and uh, Warner Brothers, and and I could go into newspapers and the consolidation uh, that's happened there. Comcast, Comcast is is CNBC, and they own Hulu and MSNBC and NBC Universal and this and that. So that's another big gigantic uh, corporate company that's looking out for its profits above everything else. Rupert Murdoch News Corp. That's Fox, of course, and uh, uh, I've forgotten the other things that they, they, they run. But Murdoch, of course, owns a, a shitload of things. And then Sony, of course, Sony has all these things that, that, that they own as, as well. So you could go on and on that five or six companies own and control the flow of information for just about all of us. Now we can go onto Facebook and say we found something original. And sometimes there are things that are original. Unfortunately, it gets down to like individual bloggers or a small website because just about anything of value that they that they think that these corporations think that they can make money from is going to be gobbled up, whether it's sports, whether it's movies, whether it's television, whether it's radio, whether it's print, whether it's whatever, they will buy it up and then they will rebrand it and it'll go under their umbrella. And so that is, that is I think, very, first of all, very stifling to, um, you know, to the, to the, to the, to the idea of a free flow of information, that five or six corporate boards or shareholders or whatever you want to call the controlling interest control the flow of information in this country. That's a problem, okay? And by the way, there used to be a thing called the FCC and there used to be a lot of, um, you know, there used to be some restrictions on this kind of thing happening. By the way, this kind of thing was foreshadowed in Pat, Patty Chayefsky's 1975 six film network if you remember i'm as mad as hell i'm not going to take it anymore well that was essentially a commentary that film was a commentary on exactly what has happened to the, the state of the media particularly television media today that it's all entertainment 
and very little about information or providing a civic good. Now you asked me why, or sorry, uh, where would you go or what should be the parameters for good journalism? Well, they, that such a thing does exist, though it's rare. Uh, I would say I could point to a couple of programs that I think are just outstanding all the time. Just about anything on PBS is very good. And mm -hmm. you say, oh, what do you mean PBS? They have news? What? Well, how about Frontline? That's been on the air for 40 years, 35 years, something like that. And every week they do a one hour feature. By the way, news is not about a six minute story or a 35 second story. News, if it's an important event, it should require more of your attention than just a soundbite or a tweet or a Facebook post. My goodness, we're talking about the future of the world here. Can we spend more than, you know, can we spend as much time on that subject watching face uh, frontline as we do the, the college football game today? Please, can we do that? I know that's difficult. Now I know I'm lecturing here and sounding kind of like pissed off and I am because these programs do exist and they're watched by not enough people. Frontline looks into the election fraud, uh, the problem with election fraud last night or Tuesday night. They're on every Tuesday here. I don't know where you are, but uh, so Frontline is one of those sh shows. And there, there are other uh, shows like that, certainly on C-SPAN where you can watch live speeches, unfiltered, without commentary of world leaders, of thinkers, of intellectuals, of authors. That's very, very good stuff. Now, let me tell you what you shouldn't be watching or what people at least should watch less of. I don't want to say you can't, you, you shouldn't watch it because it's, you have to watch some of it. But the problem that I see is that back in the day when we had what was called real journalism, uh, most of the reporters, the people that you saw on the air, either they were uh, correspondents for newspapers or television, they were people that male and female, largely male back then, who, who, who put in their time, mm -hmm. who paid their dues, who in some cases risked their life to get the story. I'm talking about, look at the, look at the old footage of the 60 Minutes correspondence that we remember, the Ed Bradley and Morley Safer, Dan Rather, people like that. They were in Vietnam. They were, they were there in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. And they're standing there in fatigues as the mortar shells are coming across the line. That's how they got to be where they are, where they, where they are, where they, well, they're, they're, they're gone now, but they paid their dues. Mike Wallace, if you look at all of these people of, of yesteryear, what I consider to be the titans of journalism, they didn't get there from just, they're not, certainly not from their looks, not from their personalities. They got there because they worked their ass off and they were brave and they were damn good at getting the, the truth. They made mistakes, yeah. They weren't perfect, but boy, they really, they were, they were journalists. That was the media. It was Ed Bradley. It was uh, uh, Mike Wallace. It was Walter Cronkite. It was people, in most cases, coming up from the front lines. Now, do you, now if you turn on the television, what do you see? What do you see? Uh, probably a 29-year-old blonde, nothing against blondes, because I'm a blonde, but 29-year-old blonde lady, and I don't, I don't mean this in a sexist way, although it'll sound that way, or, or, you know, and I like Anderson Cooper, but, you know, I, I could go on about the people that are basically the, the face of television news today. They've never stood in a war zone for the most part. Maybe Anderson Cooper has, I don't know. But I, for most of, most of these people are studio, blow hair dried, eyelash wearing, teleprompt reading, people who have never uh, really done any kind of journalistic work aside from what's fed to them by a staff of script writers and a teleprompter. That's it. So that's the problem is, do you want to trust somebody reading a teleprompter who looks pretty and, and that's pretty much what all television, and that, this is a nonpartisan comment, all the way across the board has become, it's become uh, uh, a show of pretty people, all the pretty people. And, and uh, correspondents in the field, you know, if, what you'll see now, they barely have anybody out there, but who's out there is usually going to be somebody younger, good looking, nothing wrong with good looking people, but they just, a lot of them don't pay their dues. And I think that's a real problem is when is the last time, well, I'll close with this and that get your, your response to this. When is the last, you know, we're still, we're still in Iraq, Afghanistan, right? We still have, you know, troops, uh, I guess, some presence in Iraq, and there's things going on over there. When's the last time you saw a live report on any network uh, from the front lines of, of the war, of uh, any of the wars over there, or, or anything going on right now in, uh, 
um, uh, Ar Armenia, which is uh, uh, with Azerbaijan. I believe there's a conflict there. Have you, have you seen a report from there? You see no. anything from Africa? When's the last time you saw a correspondent with a microphone in his hand or her hand broadcasting from something going on in Africa? Yeah. Well, stories from Africa don't sell. I mean, they, they don't hold viewers' attention right now. And I mean, that's why Fox News is successful, right? They're the number one news program because they, they understood that. They play to the racism that already exists. I'm not saying anything controversial with that. It's just a fact. I mean, they didn't have to go and create new racism. They just had to exacerbate and intensify the latent racism that that already exists in our population. I mean, We Are the World was a long time ago. That was, that was 35 <laughs> years ago. And that took a monumental effort to bring everyone together. And that was in the 80s and life was good and everyone had money and it was the perfect time for that. Subsequent efforts to do things like that have reached nowhere near the, um, the popularity that that did. And, and that's the reason just for better or worse, um, well, for worse, I mean, people are just largely don't give a shit about what's happening in Africa. And certainly if you're a, a Trump supporter, you couldn't care less. And even people that are more liberal and do care about world events, I mean, there is a, still an element of like, we, we don't care about Africa as much as other countries. And that's sad and that, that speaks to who we are as a people, but I don't blame news organizations for not going and doing a story in Africa because they know it's not gonna get the viewers. So that, that's our fault. I mean, a, a lot of what media covers, like we can blame the media, but like you said, look at these uh, fringe news organizations, the, the ones that are doing a good job and trying to amplify the stories that deserve to be amplified and they're speaking the truth and they're getting hardly any ratings. So that's not their fault, right? That's our fault, right? We're not consuming the news that deserves to be consumed. If we were, the Kardashians would never have existed, right? I mean, why, <laughs> why are they even a thing? Because people decided to make them a thing and therefore, you know, uh, TV has to run with it. Well, ar along those lines, Matt, I, I must say, I'm reminded of a, there was a, I, there was a couple of guys, they were, it's called Big Tuna. And they had a, I don't remember the joke exactly how it goes, but the idea was is that if a plane crashes over in Indonesia and there's 300, and, 300 Indonesians on board and you live in, uh, you know, Pflugerville, Texas, yeah. you don't care that 300 people died in, in, uh, in Indonesia. But if there's one Texan on board, it's the front page yep. in uh, Pflugerville, Texas. So, and that was the idea. It was big tuna and they made some joke out of that. But that's, that's really true. All news is local or, you know, how it, in, it impacts us. You know, why is the, the, the television local news? Why is it always a crime story? If it, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. That's, that was the old thing in television, local television news for a long time. You know, if you scare the hell out of them, they'll tune in and watch. Oh my God, there was a shooting two blocks away. I got to see what happened. And, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, so I, I certainly understand the, the sense of, you know, connectivity to world events. But, uh, you know, again, we, 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 are, we are still interconnected here. I'm not suggesting we have to be watching everything that goes on in Uganda or, you know, or, or, or whatever every day. But my goodness, it, it, how about some balance here? How about the occasional story from there or of what's going on, you know, anywhere else in the world? Or, uh, you know, that's not, that's not just everything all Trump all the time. And of course, Trump has completely warped our, all of our sense of, of reality. Uh, and that's everybody's fault. It's the consumer's fault. It's the media's fault. It's everybody. We are just all Trump all the time and certainly probably will be until at least January. So uh, this, this, this entire crowding of the space uh, is just entirely problematic. Uh, and so I, I almost think that this entire conversation is, um, it's something we have to have, you know, now, but it's probably something to have again and, you know, after Trump, because I want to see how the media changes and how particularly politicians and leaders and people, are they going to adapt some of his tactics? Are, are, is everything going to become reality television? That's the fear here mm -hmm. is that the, the, whatever you think of Trump, you know, if you want to get attention, you become a reality TV star screamer, 
and, and that's a fear monger, whatever you want to call it. That's going to get, that's going to get the cameras and the headlines and the reporters and the stories and the front page. Mm -hmm. And so I'm afraid that there's going to be a copycatism and a, a, a lot more of this. Trump going away doesn't end this phenomenon of, you know, the greasy wheel uh, gets the, you know, whatever the wheel, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That doesn't change with Donald Trump leaving. So I think that that is, you know, this is a systemic problem. It is a problem of habit amongst consumers that were always uh, reacting like mice to the jiggly little bell of the shiny object. This is a real problem. And yeah. so again, I, I, you asked me again earlier, I just have to press this home that it's important to watch programs like Frontline that take 57 minutes of your time instead of 12 seconds to read a tweet. That requires a little bit of investment on your time, but you're gonna come away with a, a broader uh, perspective about an important event. And so things like that exist. What, one other thing is uh, uh, the, the thing that I can't stress more strongly enough and people that hate the media and there's a lot of people that were accused of fake media or media slanted or it's liberal or this and that. And I want you to think about how important, uh, we haven't talked about this yet, investigative um, uh, media is, investigative news. Uh, where, where scandals are uncovered. And I'm just talking about, you know, your, your local used car lot that's turning back the odometer. That doesn't sound like a big deal, but there's stories on that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or, or, or the, the greasy uh, spoon down the street that didn't pass the health code, or, or, or there's a bribe scandal that maybe you're going to get sick and die of food poisoning. Well, that scandal needs to be exposed. You know, uh, are, are the, are the, uh, the, uh, the uh, chemical plant that's dumping uh, dangerous, deadly chemicals into the air or water, and then that's investigated, and it becomes a series uh, that, that that sometimes wins Pulitzer prizes or what have you. Th that's important, and and if you don't have the media investigating those kind of stories, you know what they go on, and a lot of that stuff goes on without that's not reported anyway. Mm -hmm. But but the fact is that we have a what's called a watchdog. We have eyes and ears. The media is the public's eyes and ears. And they're important. And that goes for whatever your, your perspective is. Right, left, Fox, CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post. It does not matter. You have to have investigative journalism looking into corruption and, and exp exploring wherever there is a possibility to exist. Because not only is it important to expose it, it's also a deterrent. Otherwise, the uh, thieves will get away with uh, a lot more. Uh, so wouldn't you say it's de it's a depressing time right now to be an investigative reporter because you could be working for the Times, the New York Times or the Washington Post and have spent months working on a story related to Trump. And then in one day, it's going to be dismissed as fake news. And then it's not even a story two days later, even though you spent months working on this. So, you know, wouldn't you rather be the 29 year old sitting in front of the camera making an easy living? I mean, what, what's happening right now <clears throat> is taking us away from investigative reporting and it's not the reporter's fault. It's, it's our fault as consumers. I mean, what you just said about, you know, we should all sit and watch Frontline. I agree with you 100 percent. But now what's the what's the plan? Like, how do you convince people to do that? And that's not a rhetorical question. I mean, how do you convince people to consume well, real, their real news differently? That, Matt, it, it sounds like I'm asking people to eat spinach here. You know, or, or, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not to like some people it is, though. To some These people, are, 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 are phenomenally know. entertaining. I mean, they're right. very well done. So you know, this is this whole misnomer about watching things that are important uh, or reading, you know, really good journalism. Uh, it, it, it's just the opposite. It's stuff that you can latch on to and believe. To me, that's much more, uh, I guess, intoxicating, even addictive than, than just the garbage that if you go to, especially these real partisan uh, websites and you'll see to complete garbage up there. And then sometimes it'll be yanked down a few hours later because it will, I mean, you just can't trust anything. To me, that's much more tiresome <laughs> than, the, than somebody who signs their real name to its story and it's been vetted and investigated and this and that. Another point I'd like to make, Matt, is that uh, the media gets attacked a lot for getting it wrong or, mm. or making mistakes. And one of the problems we haven't discussed either that's very uh, pr uh, problematic here is that news staffs, news divisions are getting uh, decimated, 
cut mm -hmm. because everything has to everything has to be profitable now, uh, including news. I don't know how new you make news profitable. By the way, that's a that's a problem. I mean, you know, selling. You know, three people got shot tonight. Try to sell that. Now, how do you how do you how do you make money out of that story? You know, I, well, wait, can I can I stop you there with, with a quick question? Yeah, so, sure. Okay, so I, I I hear you, but now what are your options, right? Because because when you talked about like um, some some more balance in news, I I think back to our casino conversation, and you're like, well, people uh, casinos need to be giving more back to their customers, and the casino is going to say. No, we don't. We're doing just fine the way we are. Like you want us to be giving you more back, but that doesn't benefit us. So now I'm a news organization. It doesn't benefit me anymore to be fair and balanced unless the audience can be convinced like yourself to put more stock in the fair and balanced reporting. Um, so don't we have to change the consumer? Because if we don't, then what's the alternative? You either need to have news organizations that are profit seeking, or if they're not profit seeking, then they have to be government run. We don't want government run news organizations, right? I mean, that's as, as socialists, we want a lot of things, but not that. So what is there an answer? Like what, how do you, and I don't have the answer at all. And that's why I'm looking to you because you have have not just been on both sides of it, but like you said, from a very young age, you've been a consumer of news and you've seen it change to the way it is today. And yes, they're going to be profit seeking. Like that's, it's hard to turn back from that. So given that they're going to be profit seeking and given that we need a balance so that we can trust the news again, where, where do no, we go? Really good. I'm glad you asked that. Let, let's, let me get back and correct one thing. The United States uh, is not known as, as having state-sponsored uh, media, like, you know, like totalitarian regimes or what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if you look at, say, the way the BBC was formed and a lot of, uh, they're called, they're quasi-state uh, news organizations that are the foundation of many Western democracies, uh, they're 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 somewhat supported, you know, by 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 the public or by by government. Although they are certainly independent editorially speaking. I mean, there's not the pressure on, uh, say, the BBC as there is the pressure on a stock a stock uh, holder driven corporation like Time Warner to squeeze every last dollar out of every single media holding that exists within that portfolio. So th this this is this is the problem. It's it's not so much that I'm against obviously the, the profit motive for essentially businesses here. What I have is 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 the the obsession with profit, how it's infected media and the coverage of media and the flow of information, where it's distorted all reality. Back in say the days of say well uh, certainly in the 50s and 60s and the Cronkite days, news divisions CBS News was the king back then largely because of Walter Cronkite and their focus on news and television news. Go read any of the chronicles of any of the people that worked in, the, in, the, in this time. It was thought of as a public service. You know, CBS was making a lot of money from its television programming and its sports and all of its, it was making a very good amount of money. And part of that public trust and part of the entertainment division was supporting this thing. I don't want to say it was charity, but the CBS news was not expected to make any money. I, it, it lost money for a number of years, but it was a small amount of money, but it, it created a greater good. There was a greater good that was created that kind of like the rising tide lifts all boats. When people are smarter and more educated and, and, and have access to tr the truth, it's going to help. It's going to help the entertainment division and sports and then this and that. So it's, it's, it's all good here. And so same thing, especially with larger companies. And I gave you five or six companies uh, that own, you know, pretty much every everything we we watch and see uh, uh, in media, they're all basically uh, squeezed for the maximum amount of profit. So you so you can't have again the investigative journalist uh, go doing a story or spending three weeks on a story to clean up the corruption that's going on down at the lead smelter plant where they're poisoning the water and all the kids are getting cancer. You can't investigate that because there's no money in it. Mm -hmm. Well, in my view, uh, I mean, this is Time Warner. 
Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, this is obviously an idealistic vision, but they're making a lot of money with their other entertainment divisions, with HBO or whatever the other holdings they have. Not everything has to be the bottom line to, down to every single dollar. I think there is an inherent public responsibility, especially with large companies, to give something back, to provide a service, to, to the greatest extent possible, provide a diversity of opinions, and certainly get to the, the truth on these things. So I would say that uh, certainly the, uh, the answer to that is, is that, is that uh, it, it, as I mentioned in Western Europe, you've had quasi-public uh, state-run media that's been very successful and is very credible. It's not all, it's not all uh, you know, uh, like Pravda or something like that. Uh, the other thing is this, the United States ha did, ha did have the Voice of America, the United States Information Agency, Radio Marti, which, which, which flooded into Cuba, providing the, United, the American perspective on Castro's Cuba. So it's not like the United States has not had state-sponsored media. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't really mind so much that, you know, a pro-American, whatever, uh, you know, in, in certain uh, circumstances. Uh, and, but I think what you're saying is you don't want to have CBS become, you know, like Pravda. I, I, of course, I, I totally get that. But I do believe that this is a this is such an, a, an important uh, a topic that, that there must be some public square of information where really the people that control things are the corporations. It's, it's the Zuckerbergs, Facebook, Twitter, social media, uh, Time Warner, Sony. They control the airwaves. Mm -hmm. And so with that licensing, with the FCC giving them a broadcast license, with that comes a, a sense of responsibility. So I believe that some degree of, uh, uh, of their resources should be spent on uh, news. And of course it is, but, but the way that, 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 that it's, it's driven toward uh, every single entity of every corporation must be profit uh, to the greatest extent possible is very uh, destructive towards what should be the goal of news divisions, not profit, the truth. It's hard to argue with anything you said. The, the only thing I can argue is that it, it's going to be tough. It, it, it's a tough road. If, if you're arguing in favor of truth and against profits, which sounds good to me and to probably most people, but ha how you reach that end is, uh, well. Well, excuse we, me, we Matt. Somebody, somebody yeah. could be very idealistic. Maybe not me, because I'm too much of a cynic by this point. But <laughs> you know, I've seen too much destruction and damage and yeah. bad things. But you know, I, there, there is this vision that you know maybe, uh, maybe if, if if something came along that you know the ratings would go up on this. I mean, if there were, if if we're all, I don't know if we're all, it's interesting. Maybe the question I I'll pose to you. I mm -hmm. not thought of this, but if Walter Cronkite was around today, first mm -hmm. of all, would he be on the air? this old guy with a, with a gray mustache with glasses on, would this guy be on the air? And number two, would anybody be watching him? What do you think? Uh, I mean, not, not the way that they were before. I mean, I, I feel like part of the issue is that, you know, spin used to be put on like uh, political things only, like people would give a political speech and there would be a spin, a positive spin or a negative spin put on it. Now there's a spin put on any news that's out there. So yeah. Walter Cronkite would say something that certain people would like, even if it's true, and a, a news organization on one side or the other would try to spin it to make it sound like he doesn't know what he's talking about. So yeah. that, that's kind of the era we're in right now. So, uh, it, and it feels like a, um, you know, the same way that we, we think that the music from our childhood was the best. <laughs> you know, Walter Cronkite was the best. You know, if Walter Cronkite was around nowadays, we'd probably find fault with him. Some of it legitimate, but for the most part, he's, he was a great, uh, you know, newscaster. And I think there's some great newscasters today, and they're just getting, you know, sort of lost in the shuffle, like you said. Um, you know, I... I'm, I'm trying to think how to wrap this up. I mean, but because it, <laughs> there's no questions just lead to further questions. And, and I, I don't want to let this get out of control. So what do you see as the future? Realistically, you said you're, you're an optimist but, or a realist and you've seen, you know, too much of, um, you know, destruction to, 
really have too much of an optimistic view, but where do we go? I mean, what, I think next week we'll discuss more about the election <laughs> yeah. specifically, yeah. but like, obviously we're going to go in two different directions if Trump wins or doesn't win. Well, um, yeah, I see what you're saying. And I, I think it's, yeah. you know, you, you, it's really simple. You, you hope for the best and you prepare for the worst. That's really the, the, the answer pretty much on everything. So whether he, he gets four more years or not, we're, we're looking to a point, uh, a post-Trump news cycle. What do you think? Do you think it, it continues the same way? Because probably, uh, like or hate Trump, if you're a news station, he's been good for you, which that's the scary part, right? No matter whether you're Fox News or CNN or MSNBC or whoever you are, Trump has increased your profits. That's scary, right? So what happens if you get a Joe Biden that, or anybody who tries to stay out of the news and now the news cycles are like, oh, we don't have anything to report. Do they try to recreate the divisiveness of Trump? Or what do you see happening there? Well, the, the news will get more stratified. Uh, you know, if, again, if we go back 50 years, it was three major networks, a couple of big newspapers that kind of drove the narrative, some, some columnists and, uh, you know, maybe a few radio, radio personalities here or there. And now it's everyone that has a laptop or a microphone or, a, uh, you know, can be a, can be a, a media person. Uh, and that's really good in a way. It's obviously it democratizes uh, free speech and anyone has, it, there is a certain sense of upward mobility that if you have the talent, you have something to say, people are going to watch you and you can put it on YouTube like we're doing here. Uh, <laughs> With on, no on talent. Facebook, yeah. And <laughs> maybe people latch on to it, you know, so that's what I think that that's actually, I think a good thing is that, you know, you're, that, that unfortunately is a buffet of a lot of bad and a lot of good, but it, it's a buffet of a lot of opportunity and a lot of right. uh, optimism. So, right. so I think that's the first thing to look at that this, this, uh, the stratification of media goes all the way down to the person uh, like yourself, myself, or anybody listening. You can be a media personality just if you have five friends on Facebook today. You are, in a sense, a very small part of the media. So mm -hmm. there's that. And then I think that what happens, depending on the election, is keep in mind that uh, what's called the, the party or the movement that's out of power is always energized in every single way, especially through their media. And for example, when Obama was president for eight years, that was really, that's what fueled a lot of right-wing websites popping up. Breitbart came, came, mm -hmm. came, came, that's a Steve Bannon uh, uh, created, you know, organization or uh, news uh, outlet came. Fox, of course, was somewhat sane. And then they became almost over the edge in, in many ways largely during the Obama presidency, gun sales went up 300%, you know, because of, again, the things that people are reading, all of the fears being uh, reinforced and magnified and exaggerated. And, and this becomes an absolute echo chamber of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a movement. And, and it's really what, what created Donald Trump to a large extent, that mm -hmm. the Tea Party and other factors as well. So what happens is, is after, say, January of 2021, if Joe Biden is in office, hey, Joe Biden is no left-wing radical or socialist, but they are going to make him out to be. And mm -hmm. everything that AOC or Talib or, uh, uh, or any liberal, so-called liberal, uh, anything that they say that's the least bit controversial is going to be megaphoned to, you know, 40 million people. And so it, it all of a sudden... The, you know what's going to what's going to what's going to be the narrative? It's going to be those headlines on all those far right uh, sites. And if Joe Biden tried to just tries to do anything as president that's the least bit Obama esque, and what I mean is an AC uh, uh, Affordable Care Act kind of expansion, anything that's the least bit Obama esque, there he's going to get crucified in the headlines, in the alternative right stories, and that doesn't even bring up the conspiracy theories and all of that nonsense. Mm -hmm. So, so th this, is, this is like you said, it's going to be a very good thing for the far right and for their ratings. And, you know, it's very hard to play, conversely, it's very hard to play defense. You know, if, if I, there was a thing called Air America that was launched during the Obama presidency, which was a left-wing, supposedly, left-wing uh, version of 
um, uh, of, of essentially Rush Limbaugh and the, all those Savage and all those people that are on far right talk radio. Actually, I think it predates that. It was back during Bush, but they were they were trying to have a alternative to that. And liberals apparently don't listen to radio. Number one, nearly as much, and it collapsed after a couple of years. Even Al Franken, by the way, was one of the um, uh, was one of the uh, the personalities. So it wasn't for lack of talent or big names. So uh, this whole idea that uh, you know what's what's going to happen. It all depends, of course, on who wins the election, and it all depends upon uh, the reaction to who's in the White House. And by the way, that's just such a out of whack uh, balance because you know, really, it, the person in the White House really shouldn't matter all that much, right? Right. The problem is the person that the party, whoever it is. Now Trump just amplifies everything here, but if it's red or blue in the White House, it amplifies everything associated with the media. And that's really the, I'll leave it with this, that's the sad thing here, mm -hmm. is that it's very difficult now to get any kind of uh, real clear vision through the fog. I mean, it's, it, it's so murky, it's so partisan, it's so divided, Think everything is loaded. If you make any kind of mistake in, in the media, you get crucified. Uh, even politicians I feel sorry for to a certain extent because if they, you know, they're human. They occasionally say things, uh, go off script, or they'll say they'll they'll say something that's wrong. That's just inevitable if you're a public life. And so now there's microphones everywhere to catch that. There didn't used to be. Right. Why wasn't there scandals back during Eisenhower's day? Because there wasn't a microphone in front of Dwight Eis Dean Eisenhower every uh, everywhere he spoke. Right. He could right. go off the cuff and with a reporter and not get you know. So th th this entire thing of this sense of immediacy this amplification of, of what happens, the partisan filters, everything here is, is ramped up so high that I do believe that there is people like me, you, probably people listening that are sick of it, that, that, that now we want to dial it back. And we've got to, again, I talk about frontline. I talked about investigative reporting. I talk about people we can support, even C-SPAN, which People make fun of their ratings, but you know what? They do provide an important public service. There's mm -hmm. outlets out there, BBC. Uh, there's other things out there that we can watch, see to get our information, even Facebook. And there's nothing to me, I'll go back to the very first thing I said about the written word. There's nothing like a really good magazine piece that runs 10 pages investigating a scum scumbag. Mm -hmm. And you get to see them exposed in print. Now I know it'd be better to have the footage and you have it on, on Twitter, but you know what? There's nothing like getting into the salacious details of somebody who's doing something wrong and got caught. So I really, I, I still think there's always going to be at least an audience for that. And there's going to be an absolute need for that. Uh, that is a great wrap up. Uh, it sounds like a, a, a fair mix of optimism and pessimism, which leads us perfectly into next week, which is going to be the election. So <laughs> um, I, I think we're in agreement that that's, definitely going to be our topic for next week. And I think it's probably going to tie into our discussion of, of the media um, this week, because uh, Lord knows the media coverage of elections has been pretty interesting going back the past few decades. So um, I think there was a lot to talk about today and there's going to be a lot to talk about going forward. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed this and you'll, you'll listen with us next week as well as we do another intelligent conversation. Goodbye for now.